So just a little bit of rationale for this talk. Uh, in preparing for it, I was looking at some of the other videos from the previous talks. You've seen a lot of research talks. Um, those are very high level, obviously. This is a workshop, so it's going to be a bit more nuts and bolts. So I'm going to be focused today really on probabilistic models. And I'll come to this in a few more slides. Um, but before we get to that, just a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, the slides and I have some associated notes are up on that GitHub link. Uh, they should be live right now. Uh, you'll see the PDFs there. I'm a professor at UBC in computer science and pathology and a scientist at BC Cancer. Uh, there's sort of an outdated website you can look up if you're interested and there's my email address. Uh, this is not going to be super relevant for most of you at this point, but I am currently looking for students and postdocs. So a little bit about my research. Um, I sort of think about it in three modules. There's sort of this overarching idea of cancer biology and specifically evolutionary questions in cancer biology. For me, that often comes in the form of how can we actually make measurements to start to infer things about the evolution of tumors? And that's really where we get into this middle module, which is computational methods. So this typically comes in the form of software that implements various probabilistic models. Um, so what I was saying is the main sort of things I do are develop probabilistic models and software that implements them to answer those questions in cancer biology. Maybe you're right, maybe I won't work, walk on this floor. Uh, but then I think I'm out of the camera. Um, and then at the bottom of this hierarchy, you see this statistics and machine learning. And the interest in this really comes from the fact that a lot of these probabilistic models can be challenging to fit. Um, so this really motivates a lot of interest in efficient methods for doing things like Monte Carlo Markov chain methods. Now there's sort of a flow chart here where things go from top to bottom. So problems in cancer biology motivate probabilistic models, which then motivate the development of new Monte Carlo methods. But this often goes the other way too. Um, as we have better methods to fit uh, our models, we can then build more complex models, and that opens up the opportunity to look at more interesting questions. All right, so to the sort of meat of this, um, what is probabilistic modeling? In general, it's sort of any way of modeling data that treats it as random. So I'd say the contrast here would be mathematical models where you have things like ordinary differential equations um, and your data is then a deterministic function of a bunch of parameters. Probabilistic model says that there's some randomness in that. More generally, what we'll talk about today are models where the parameters are sort of organized in a hierarchy. And really, the focus here will be on Bayesian models. Um, <laughs> can anyone give me an example of a probabilistic model that maybe they're working on? Or OK, I'm going to have to pick on people. Anyone in Jens's group must be working on a probabilistic model. <laughs> so. I assume you presented on this a couple days ago. Uh, so should I explain my problem? So just, you did present on it, right? So people have seen the work? Yeah. Okay, so there's an example. Can anyone think of something that's a non-probabilistic model? So is anyone doing sort of pure simulation-based work where they're using differential equations, things like that? Pardon me? Yeah, that's a good one. And one thing we actually commonly have in genomics is sequence alignment. Short read sequence alignment is an example of a very non probabilistic model um, where we sort of do something a bit more heuristic and we just try to find the best match. That can, of course, be reframed as a probabilistic problem, but it's super hard and computationally challenging. 
So why are we interested in probabilistic models? The basic reason always is that the data is noisy, right? So when we think about cancer, there's a couple sources of noise. Let's see if this is better. <laughs> um, some of it is just technical error, right? So if we're doing sequencing, um, you know, there's going to be sequence error, stochastic coverage. Some of it's biological variation, right? Um, and probabilistic models are very good at handling both of these. So we can handle random variation by assuming that the data is coming from a, a distribution. And then we can handle systematic variation, and we'll see this later, by introducing hidden or latent variables into the model. So as a thought question here, if, let's think of a really old problem, which is calling SNVs from bulk sequence data. So match normal, super old school, right? What are some of the sources of technical variation and biological variation in this data set? Anybody? <laughs> I'm going to start pointing at people <laughs> soon. Go ahead. Yeah, that's a biological thing. What, ab what about in cancer? Are we always sequencing pure no, tumors? There is uh, heterogeneous, so we have different clones, subclones in cancer, but some of them have some mutations and others, they just don't. Exactly. So those issues are going to impact our ability to identify variants, right? And so if we want to do this in a probabilistic framework, we're going to have to think about how to account for all those issues. So the main focus in this workshop is to look at how to build probabilistic models. And some of the questions we'll look at, how do you construct a model that's appropriate for the data that you have? How can we estimate the model parameters? And something that maybe is not that well um, taught is how do we report those parameters? For example, how can we say how certain we are in our estimates? So as we work through the later modules, the point is not to focus on the model that we're building. Most of them will be a bit simplistic. Um, though maybe they can be extended to more interesting cases. What I really want you to think about is the process that we're going to go through um, and keep questions like these in mind. So a rough sketch of how I would go about building a probabilistic model. Um, the absolute first step is to identify a problem and a well-defined problem. And then we want to look at the data and understand some of its features. And then we can start building a model in sort of simple steps. Then once we have a model in mind, the question is, how do we fit it? So we have to think about inference techniques. And then we'd like to validate the model. So in a bit more detail, this is probably the single most important thing, is to identify a well-defined problem. If you don't have this, you'll never make any progress, right? So some of the key considerations are, what are we actually trying to measure? What is the biological phenomena? How do we encapsulate that in sort of something that we can interpret a parameter? Um, what type of data will we have? So it's sort of great to say that we're going to build phylogenies of clones, um, but our strategy is going to be very different if we have bulk sequence data or single cell data. And it's going to be very different even if we have single cell data depending on the actual platform we use. So one point that's easy to miss at this stage is to look around and say, what are the current approaches that exist? Um, so often when you're working on some new exciting problem, you may think, well, there's no published method that exists. 
what they're often, if you're in that regime, there is often really simple and obvious solutions that actually exist already to solve your problem. And a really good way to figure out what those would be is to talk to biologists, bioinformaticians that are already looking at the data and see what they're doing. The alternative solution may just be a really simple thing like a t-test or a Fisher exact test, but that gives you a baseline approach from which you can then compare to as you develop something that you think is better. So an anecdote, when I was starting my PhD, I was doing paired tumor normal variant calling. Had I done this first, I would have quickly learned that a Fisher exact test is very, very hard to beat for that problem, at least in terms of predictive performance. There are other features that a probabilistic model can bring, but if I had just looked for that baseline first, it, it would have maybe dissuaded me from pursuing that problem, okay? So, okay, you have a problem defined. The next thing to do is to look at your data. You want to do some form of exploratory analysis. So, if you don't do this, you may miss key features of your data that are sort of non-obvious when you just sort of abstractly hear about single cell whole genome sequencing. So, for example, single cell whole genome sequencing is often very low depth. That's going to dramatically change what you can do. If you use, say, MDA, you're going to have some sort of error rate that you may never expect. Um, and if you do some exploratory analysis, you can, sort of, you can often uncover these things quickly, and that'll save you a lot of time down the line as you start to build models. So some, hopefully some of you can answer this, answer these questions. As an example, what would you think if we tried to use five prime single cell RNA-seq to call variants? And, has anyone seen has anyone seen 10x data? Has anyone done any single cell RNA seq here? No. Okay. So I, I'll shortcut this one then for you, and just say that there are strategies that let you sequence across the entire transcript, and there are strategies that only give you tags at the end. Right. So both are single cell RNA seq, but you're probably not going to be able to identify very many variants if you're only looking at tags at the end of the transcript, okay? So has anyone looked at single cell DNA sequencing here? Good. So how practical is it to call SNVs, for example, in that data? Why? Awesome. And those are exactly the problems, right, that you learn by just looking through the data initially. Um, and is anyone looking at copy number data? Okay. So how reliable is binned read count? How representative of that is, is that of just copy number? There's also variation there. From? Okay. Exactly, and again, simple exploratory analysis often reveals these things, right? So, okay, you've got a problem, you know what your data looks like, um, now you want to build a model. It, the first time you do this, your natural reaction might be to go and build the most complex thing you can imagine, try to model every facet of the data. Right? That almost never works. So there's two issues. One, you'll always need to simplify models to get to something tractable. But even once you have a simplified model, it may make sense to start with an even smaller subproblem that you can manageably address. What we'll see in the, is that in the framework of Bayesian hierarchical modeling, once you've done that, it's very easy then to take what you've built and plug it into something more complex. 
So that sort of plugging in is usually motivated by this idea of sharing statistical strength. And what we'll see is this really means introducing some form of shared parameter among the data points. So model in hand, the question then becomes, how do you estimate the parameters? How do you fit the data to the model, right? Um, there are different ways to do this. There's sort of more rigorous statistical approaches. And in that field, there's frequentist and Bayesian statistics. So here we'll fo focus on the Bayesian approach. There's also less statistically motivated ways, sort of optimizing some objective function that may not necessarily have a clear probabilistic interpretation. Um, so core question that you have is, how do you report your parameters? Um, what exactly should you give as, say, a point estimate? How do you communicate uncertainty? Now, there's an interplay here between inference and model building, as I alluded to in sort of one of the early slides. If we can't fit a model to data, it's not a particularly useful model, right? And our ability to do that is somewhat a function of the inference techniques that we have available. Um, so if we have better inference techniques, we can build more complex or interesting models and fit them. So the final step in this process is to validate the model. Um, I think two obvious important questions that come up is, does your inference algorithm work? Okay? And the other one is, does your model actually fit real data well and sort of estimates the biological quantity of interest well? So the first question is actually fairly straightforward to, um, to assess at least in probabilistic models because you can simulate data, fit the data, and then see if you're recovering the true parameters. This can be formalized a little bit more, but that's the basic idea. The other question is much harder because you actually need some form of real world ground truth data. Um, depending on what you're working on, this can be really hard to come by, right? Uh, so single cell sequencing, for example, is destructive. You're not going to go back and be able to remeasure the same cell. This is where you need to sit down and do a little bit of experimental design and think about what are some nice controlled experiments you can do to generate data. Um, one point I will say is you should never assess how well your model works by looking at data simulated from your model. That if you are not outperforming other methods on data simulated from your model, you are doing something wrong. That's sort of a key flaw that's easy to make. Um, so now let's switch gears and get into Bayesian inference. So this is how we're going to actually fit our models. So there's a couple of things, <laughs> some basic probability theory that everybody probably knows, but will come up again and again in this talk. Uh, there's sort of three basic equations that you'll frequently need when building Bayesian probabilistic models. The first one is the what I'll call the joint distribution, but it basically is just the decomposition of a bivariate distribution into a conditional and an unconditional, right? Then there's Bayes' rule, which basically says how to compute one conditional in terms of another. And then there's the law of total probability, which basically lets you compute a complex probability by decomposing it into a, a number of conditionals, right? This sort of sets us up for Bayesian inference. Um, in the Bayesian setting, the key thing is that model parameters are considered random quantities in the same way as your data. Right? So this is, a diff this is different than the frequentist paradigm where parameters are sort of some true thing that you don't know but are fixed. So the core quantity that we're 
always interested in Bayesian inference is computing the posterior distribution, uh, this guy here. And the way we get to that is by using Bayes' rule. And here, x is the data. Theta are our model parameters. P of x given theta is the likelihood, the probability of the data given the parameters. And P of theta is the prior, right? In the denominator is this nasty thing, the normalization constant, sometimes called the model evidence. And that's typically pretty hard to compute. Maybe if I do this, I don't have to walk too much. So the key sort of tenet of Bayesian inference is that everything you need to know is encapsulated in the posterior. So once you've computed the posterior, you have all the information about the parameters the data is going to give you. But, and so how that works is that we begin with prior belief about the parameters. So this may be really vague. So we may just say, we don't know what it is, it's anything. Or we may have some more informative priors, which we'll see later. Then we update our belief about the parameters by observing the data and computing the posterior. If we were then to see new data, this posterior becomes our new prior, right? So there's this sequential thing about constantly updating our beliefs about parameters. So, in principle, the posterior tells us everything we need to know about theta, the parameters. But if the parameters are high dimensional, then we have a distribution over many dim dimensions. I would speculate most people in this room would struggle to visualize a distribution over more than three dimensions, four maybe in a pinch. So if you have hundreds of parameters, how do you sort of report something about that distribution back to uh, other people. So one idea that's commonly used is just to make point estimates. We just report the mean of the distribution, maybe the variance, things like that. We can also report measures of uncertainty by giving regions, right? So this is much like confidence intervals that hopefully everyone has seen. Those are the frequentist analogs here. Um, but if we have a posterior distribution, right, we can do things like report this region that, say, has 95% of the mass as our 95% credible interval. right? So what we're saying there is our posterior belief is that, how do I say this accurately? Uh, we're, I'm just going to say it inaccurately. We're 95% confident that the parameters in that interval, roughly. So many of you may have seen Bayesian inference and sort of cover it roughly. One thing that's not maybe taught as often is loss functions. So this is a more formal way to derive point estimates. Um, the simple idea of a loss function is it's a function of two variables, x and y. And it basically measures if we were to predict x and the true value is y, how bad do we feel about that? Um, so some really common ones that are used would be the L1, which is just the absolute value of the difference between the two. The, two. the other one would be the L2, which is the squared difference. Um, and the point of a loss function in the Bayesian framework is that we will minimize the expected loss under our posterior, right? So we need to compute see if we can do this. this expectation of the loss under our posterior, which if the parameters are continuous, is an integral like this, right? And then we need to minimize over this. All right. Yep. The well, we're using the post. We're basically weighting our loss by the posterior. That's the big difference. We have the posterior distribution, and we're going to compute the expected loss under that posterior. So it's going to say, I don't, let's think about this here. Um, 
we're going to try to find a value under this posterior such that um, our loss, our weight at loss by this thing is minimized, right? This is not just to choose basically which value you report in the end. Yes, exactly. Sorry. Yeah. Just to be clear, that's, that's what it's for. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a point estimator like I've shown here. It can actually, your loss function can be like a, a region sort of weighted thing. Um, so it's quite, it's a very, very general way to come up with an est a final estimator that you want to report. There we go. All right. So to me, the most appealing thing about the Bayesian paradigm is that we have this hierarchical structure where v parameters, variables are random quantities, right? This means in turn that the parameters that govern the distribution, sorry, the hyperparameters that govern the distribution of our parameters are also, can also be random quantities. So we can come up with a hierarchical model, which we'll talk about in a bit. Um, what's really nice is this creates a modularity that we can use uh, to build more complex models. Sorry, one last question about this. So is yeah. there some equivalence then between like a uh, map estimate or a mean and a certain loss? Of yeah, like uh, the map estimate, I, I'm going to get this slightly wrong, but I think the map estimate is just putting a, like a delta function on, is a loss with a delta function on the mode or something like that. Um, so you can kind of cook it to get the mass to map estimate, but this is better. <laughs> All right, so within the Bayesian framework, the real question is how do you compute the posterior? Um, so conceptually, this is an easy question. You, you apply Bayes' rule. In practice, it's pretty hard because you need to compute the normalization constant, this integral. And so if you have a lot of parameters in your model, maybe they're a mixture of continuous and discrete, this is going to be really, really hard. Um, it's pretty much always, most models, it's actually impossible to compute this. So there's two strategies. One, you just avoid explicitly ever computing the normalization. Or two, you use some sort of advanced method that lets you compute that value. Um, typically, the vast majority of methods avoid explicit computation. And as a result, we're always trying to compute some approximation to the posterior, not the true posterior. So the absolute simplest approximation one can make to a distribution is to say that it is a single point. And the question is, which point do you want to pick? Well, one reasonable thing to do is to pick the mode. Right? So I'm going to say my entire distribution is just one point at the highest value of the posterior. Right? And this is what's called maximum a posteriori or map estimation. Right? So this is tractable. It seems intractable because you have to take the maximum of the posterior. But because the posterior is proportional to the joint distribution, um, you don't actually need to evaluate the normalization constant. So you can still find this point just by looking at the joint. So one of the strengths of map estimation is that it's reasonably easy and computationally efficient to perform. This is especially true when your parameters are continuous then you can differentiate the joint and do gradient descent. It gets a lot harder if your parameters are discrete, and especially if they have a large state space. Um, <laughs> the map estimate is obviously kind of a dumb estimate of a distribution, uh, because you put a point to represent an entire distribution. The other issue with the map estimate and it's going to look a little pathological. Can everyone see this? Is sometimes your mode 
is very atypical of the rest of the distribution. So there's actually, this isn't the best drawing, shrink that even further. There can be very little mass around the mode and all the mass is somewhere else. So your map estimate is not actually very reflective of what's going on. In 2D, or in this case, in one dimension, this looks really artificial. As you move to really high dimensions, though, this can become more of an issue. So can anyone think of a case when the map estimator is hard to compute? Give you a hint. That's bang on. So in phylogenetics, if you're trying to compute the tree topology, it's a discrete space that's huge, right? It's about, if you have n species in classical phylogenetics, there's about n factorial trees. If you want to find the map estimator, what's the best, how, how do you do that? Essentially, you have to enumerate all the trees and score them. By that point, you've already computed the posterior. So this brings us to the alternative that we'll consider today, um, MCMC methods. And before we go into detail, we'll talk a little bit about Monte Carlo in general. So in the Bayesian setting, we actually, though we want the posterior, what we usually end up doing is computing some expectation under the posterior, right? So think loss functions like we just mentioned. The idea of Monte Carlo methods is sort of this following simple observation. If we want to compute this expectation here, which is equal to this integral, then all we, one way we can do that is just to draw random samples from the distribution P here and plug them into our test function H that we're trying to compute the expectation for and then we weight by one over the number of samples. The key idea here is if we, do, if we draw a lot of samples, this gets very close to this expectation, right? And as a result, this integral. Um, this is just sort of a basic probability result from the law of large, uh, law of large numbers. So this is great. And it suggests that if we could sample from the posterior, we could compute all the expectations and be happy, right? But sampling from the posterior is typically, at least directly, as hard as computing the posterior, right? So the basic idea of Markov chain Monte Carlo methods is to sidestep that and instead construct a Markov chain which, and this sort of the technical term, is admits the posterior as its invariant distribution. What this means is that if we run the Markov chain long enough, and then we start collecting samples, those samples are coming from the posterior distribution. So there's sort of a core issue with Markov MCMC methods and comes from what I just said, is that we're only guaranteed to actually draw samples from the posterior in the infinite limit. So only if we run our MCMC forever are we drawing exactly from the posterior. That seems like a, <laughs> a bit of an issue computationally. In practice, though, the Markov chain usually gets close in sort of distributional terms to our posterior in a finite number of iterations. So after, once we're close, then we can sample. We're already approximating the posterior by just taking these uh, samples. So this just adds a little bit more noise because we're a little distance away from sampling from the true posterior. In practice, what this means, though, is that when we first start our Markov chain off, it may be very, very far from the true posterior. 
So we will have to run it for a while before we get close enough. And so that means we often have to discard some number of samples from the initial part of the chain called burn-in, and then we only look at the samples after that point. Uh, there are some diagnostics you can look into in the literature for this, but nothing is perfect. Um, the other key idea in MCMC you'll see come up quite a lot is this idea of thinning. So because we're using a Markov chain, our samples are not independent. They're going to look like the previous value we saw. Right? We're not going to move somewhere totally different typically. Um, this actually is not an issue for the asymptotics, so the sort of the validity of this algorithm isn't affected. Uh, but what it is an issue for is if we take 10 samples from our MCMC method, they're not as efficient as 10 samples if we could draw directly from the posterior. So we'll typically have to use a large number of iterations. One thing people do is they only retain every nth sample. So for example, we, have, we make 1,000 draws, and we only keep every hundredth, right? So now we only have 10 samples. These will be less correlated than if we would kept all the samples. Um, but there's actually no advantage to doing thinning. So it does reduce storage costs. So if you can't afford to write these things to disks or store them in memory, then you can thin. But it actually will never outperform just keeping all the samples. So this is sort of a misconception in some of the literature. OK, so MCMC is sort of a big umbrella that encapsulates a lot of algorithms. The most famous and easiest to implement is the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm. So the basic idea of the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm is we have some distribution called the proposal, Q. And this can depend on the current value of the chain theta. And we use that to propose a new value, theta prime. Now, we can either keep that proposed value with this probability. So it's essentially the ratio of the posterior under our new value to the posterior under our old. And then the, divide it by the chance of proposing from our new to the old and vice versa. What's nice, and this is really the trick of the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm, is the normalization constant, P of x, which you need for this, cancels. So you can just evaluate the joint distribution. Right? If you don't decide to keep the, current, uh, the new value, you just stay at the old value. And you keep doing this again and again. So the main challenge in implementing the Metropolis-Hastings algorithm is finding a good proposal distribution. If you're true distribution looks like this, and your proposal looks like this, you're almost never going to propose values that are high in joint probability, right? So it's very hard to actually make good moves and explore this posterior. Um, the base, there are some simple ideas, like random walk metropolis hastings, and then you can adapt some of the parameters to get good proposals. Uh, in general, there's going to be some amount of tuning when you implement this, getting that proposal right. So the other famous MCMC algorithm that we'll talk about in, these, in this workshop is Gibbs sampling. And the setup for Gibbs is a little bit more complex. Now imagine that our parameters theta can be split into two parts, theta 1 and theta 2. right? The key thing here is that we can compute from the condi ah, sorry, we can sample from the conditional distribution of theta 1 given theta 2 in the data, and we can also do the same thing for theta 2 given theta 1 in the data. So the idea of the Gibbs sampler is then to draw samples from theta 1 given theta 2, then use those to draw samples from theta 2 given theta 1, and just keep doing that again and again. So the Gibbs sampler is most useful when the model has some form of conjugacy. So I'm not going to 
give the detailed specification of this, but if you know what that is, great. Typically, most models don't have this, so it limits the use case for the Gibbs sampler. But it always works if your parameters are discrete, and especially if the state space is small, because then this, to compute this distribution is just to enumerate all your discrete values to get the normalization. Um, so this is not necessary the first condition. Sorry, can you say that again? The first condition is not necessary. It's just so if it's not, uh, you can still use it if it's not conditional conjugacy. Yeah, yeah. So th th so there are ways around the conditional conjugacy, even if it's not discrete. So one example is if it's one dimensional, you can numerically compute the integration, or you can actually use inverse sampling to sample from the distribution. So it is possible to get around it, but typically once you're in that regime, it's not any more efficient than doing something else. Um, so one thing about the Gibbs sampler is it can get stuck in modes pretty easily. Uh, particularly if there is some correlation between theta one and theta two, because it's always updating one condition on the other. It can't make a big move that you would need to, Let's see if I can draw this. If your distribution looks something like this, let's think, you're trying to move here, basically the problem with the Gibbs sampler is this, you're here, all you can do is move here or up. You can never move this way, right? Because you're only up going one direction or the other. That's essentially what it's saying. Um, as a result, it can get stuck in modes. Um, this one it wouldn't, but it can. So one thing you can do to alleviate that problem is to mix in some metropolis hasting steps that update both the parameters jointly. So revisiting the MH algorithm. Sometimes it's pretty hard to find a good proposal distribution for very high dimensional parameters. So if you have a vector of 10,000 parameters, your proposal distribution cannot move very far in any one parameter. And this is just the curse of dimensionality. Essentially, the more parameters you have, the further your distance, if, if you were to change all the components by the same amount, the bigger your overall distance is, right? And big distances tend to lead you to very different probabilities that are often much lower, so you end up rejecting your new proposal all the time. One way to get around this is to identify blocks of parameters. So here we rewrite our high dimensional parameter theta as theta one through theta b, where we have b blocks of hopefully lower dimensional parameters, right? So this could, for example, just be each dimension of the model, but that doesn't have to be that strict. You can group some of the dimensions of the parameters together. Then you can use a Metropolis-Hastings algorithm to target the conditional distribution of one block given all the others. So this is a lot like the Gibbs sampler, right? But now we're gonna use a Metropolis-Hastings step the nice thing is when you go through the acceptance ratio that you need to use, the normalization cancels out again, and you end up back at the exact same metropolis Hastings that you normally compute. So it's just all you need to be able to do is evaluate the joint. You never actually need to know how to compute this conditional. So there's a bit of variance on this, but you may see this referred to as the metropolized Gibbs algorithm. In practice, if you're going to implement MH on a high dimensional model, you basically have to do this. So we'll never, you'll never get a high dimensional proposal to get accepted um, without doing this. The, one interesting sort of observation is if our proposal distribution is the conditional, then everything cancels out and our acceptance probability becomes one. And actually that's the Gibbs sampler, right? So the, Gibbs is just one face on Metropolis Hastings. Okay, let's take a breather. Um, that was a slightly, yeah, this is a good time to take a break. Uh, and we'll come back and we'll cover the next module, which should hopefully be a little bit less theoretical and a bit more applied. All right.